hope you are all doing well and that you're staying safe. You've got a little warning that you need right now, though. Dewey is on a rampage. He wants to jump all over the desk right now, so that is probably bound to happen if he doesn't knock over the light first. Whatever happens, we're going to find out. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to do with you guys today was a little bit of uh, live stream housekeeping. So first thing is tell me how my audio sounds. So just so you guys know, a little of the behind the scenes of what's going on over here is I use my Zoom recorder for all of my audio. And it's always worked well when I've recorded the file directly to the Zoom. But when I try to plug it into the computer in order to get these live streams done, apparently it's just not sounding that great, which is uh, a little unfortunate, but I'm going to work on it. So tell me how my audio sounds and if this doesn't work out i'm gonna fix it for next time if not try to unplug the zoom right now so the other half of that is the visual what i've actually done is i've ordered the new mevo so i think that's going to improve the video quality that we've got here hopefully it ships sometime in the near future i know it's a, a very in-demand product right now it's also the newer version of the mevo which didn't even start to sh uh ship until april so all right we've got we've got an audio comment the audio is a little muffled interesting Audio is 20. All right, let's doesn't sound good. All right, you know what? Hang tight, guys. Let's see what happens. I'm just going to unplug and see if this works. I'm kind of back, but I'm muffled. Hold, hang tight. We're going we're going to work on this together. Let's see, let's let's see what I can do here to see if I can get my uh, my computer mic to pick it up for me. So the thing that I'm going to do with the mic also. Oh, oh, Dewey, hi, goodbye. All right, here we go. Back to the uh, back to the Mac microphone here. So I think this should be a little better. What do you guys think? Let me, yeah, someone already saw Dewey. Let me know what you think. So one of the things that I'm gonna do to fix this problem is I think what I need is, I think I need a USB microphone. I think the Zoom is just a little too old or maybe one of the pieces that are being used to connect the Zoom to the computer just isn't functioning properly. So now I am going to purchase a USB microphone and we're gonna see what happens. So hopefully that arrives early next week. The other thing that I'm going to try to do here is you see you see this uh, this blank space over here. I've been watching a lot of OBS tutorials about adding images and trying to just spice up the look of my video, not just camera quality, but just to fill some of this dead space here, even though it's very busy behind me. But I started designing a little something and, you know, I don't. I'm not a Photoshop pro. I know how to do all the basics and I can come up with the very simple graphics and stuff, but as far as being like an official graphic designer, I most certainly am not that, but for next week, I'm going to try to design a little something, uh, a little something pretty to go along with this video. So that's where all the housekeeping stands right now. Again, you guys know I'm just learning and I'm trying to do all this on my own and I'm trying to learn along the way. So thank you guys for all of your feedback as I get these live streams better and better each week. In case you guys missed it on the channel, I don't know if you need any sort of weekend night activity, but I did a watch along slash drink along with Matt Donato for all eight episodes of the new Netflix series, Bruise Brothers. So, you know, if you wanna kinda like kick back and relax and hopefully enjoy watching the show with us or watching us watch the show i mean it got crazy by the end of it but check it out all eight episodes are on the channel and it should be a good time so i hope you guys enjoy let's get into these stories now so the first one i have on my list i want to get the uh the negativity yeah <laughs> yes i know ed dewey wants attention dewey always wants attention 24 7. i'm surprised he's not talking right now he just sat on the couch so i think he's finally pleased but i want to get the negative story out of the way first which is the update on amc's current situation reports have been breaking that analysts are expecting amc to file for bankruptcy which 
Of course, it's it's extremely disappointing. And I'm just going to read you one of the quotes from analyst Eric Handler, which gives you a general sense of what the situation is over there. He says, based on our view that theaters will be closed until at least August and our belief that AMC lacks the liquidity to stay afloat until that time, we expect the company will soon be faced with filing for bankruptcy. So, you know, this is this is a huge bummer and it's very, very scary. And I don't want to explain all this stuff as though I know the nitty gritty and I know the fine print because because I don't. I'm not well versed in that kind of stuff and basically I've just been trying to learn more by googling and searching things out there and I have seen some more encouraging reports that filing for bankruptcy serves a purpose. It isn't necessarily a death blow that's going to say that AMC theaters are going to be gone forever but it could pave the way to vital restructuring so my hope is that you know if bankruptcy is what needs to happen right now that hopefully that will keep the company afloat in some sense but we're gonna have to wait and see and amc isn't the only company in this in this situation right now we have gigantic theater chains out there like there's regal too and i'm not saying regal is planning to file for bankruptcy right now but there are a lot of big theater chains out there there are a lot of small theater chains out there and this is just this is a wild, unexpected situation, and I think when we come out of it, we are going to see a pretty grand restructuring of the theater-going industry in general. And, you know, I'm curious to see how they handle all this. I feel for all the employees that have lost work during all of this. I think that's the thing that's bothering me most, or, you know, just all, all the folks out there who don't have their regular income and maybe see careers that they've poured their, their hearts and souls into just evaporating before their eyes. So, I mean, the best I can offer right now is, is stay hopeful and we're going to have to take it one day at a time and we're going to have to do what's in our own best interest and we're going to have to do whatever we think uh, is going to be in the theater's best interest too. We don't know exactly when we're going to be able to go back and continue supporting these places and these movies that we love so much much so we're gonna have to see what happens on this front let's check in, in with some live chatters right now uh, we have Neil oh no all right I'll, I'll get to Neil first but Neil is saying that uh, AMC a list may have hurt them and I don't know about that I think the the two situations are completely detached but you know, I don't really think we ever saw theater subscriptions taking off in, in a game-changing way from a company perspective, but, you know, when we get back to it, I'm curious to see if something like that is still intact. And maybe if, again, I brought this up on a previous live stream, but maybe if some of these theater chains partner with other entities to help them stay afloat and to work together in order to you know get movies in front of eyes again because there's there's no doubt in my mind it's not going to be a snap your finger return right back to it scenario we now have a super chat from michael what you got for us my i think i think michael just donated that that was Mighty kind of you, Michael. So Michael is a longtime supporter of the Patreon campaign. And if you guys have not seen this, one of my favorite vlogs I ever did on this YouTube channel was learning about AFL. So very early on, Michael wanted a reaction video to the top AFL marks of all time. And I did it without doing any research. I just kind of threw myself into it along with my good buddy Al Lowe and you know to be completely frank with you guys we got a lot of crap for it because we were watching this and had no clue what we were talking about and people weren't happy about it because AFL has a ton of hardcore fans so in response to that negative response to my video I went out and I met some of the players from the AFL uh, Dragons out in Los Angeles and they taught me how to to play and it, it was incredible. I'll, I'll never, in particular, the skill that impresses me the most, especially as a basketball player, is the dribbling involved in the game because the, the ball is not a round ball like a basketball. So it was incredibly difficult, but that was just such a fun day and those were such fun videos to put together. So Michael, thank you for everything, for all your encouragement and support, and I hope you're staying safe right now. All right, topic number two. This is our title topic for the day. It is the news that... Disney Plus is going to get a live-action remake of the 1973 animated classic, 
Robin Hood. So this report came from THR, and also according to THR, we've got blind spotting director Carlos Lopez Estrada. He's going to be the one directing it. That right there is what makes me most hyped for it because obviously blind spotting is great, but I also was lucky enough to catch his new movie, Summertime, at Sundance this year. And you know, Summertime is a very unique movie. It is largely to told through, it's a story told through spoken word, and it's got like a whole bunch of mini stories within it that connect. So I can't really say there's anything, actually, maybe I'll walk this back. I was about to say there's nothing about that movie that would suggest that he'd be the right one to helm this, but there's something about the spirit of that movie that I think could go hand hand in hand with this kind of adaptation just because you know when I think about most Disney classic animated movies I, I want to leave those movies with my spirit lifted and just remembering how I felt after seeing Summertime I don't know I was just like I was so proud of everyone involved and I kind of wanted to just give everyone a big hug they were so talented and it was just a movie where everybody was so willing to wear their heart on their sleeves and to such great effect. So I was very impressed by that. And I'll see any movie he directs at this point. But the interesting thing about this Robin Hood story is that according to the report, the new take is said to be a musical and will again feature the characters as anthropomorphic, this time in a live action CG hybrid format. So I saw a lot of people online immediately go to Cats. Don't do what you did with Cats. And I agree with you on that. Do not do that ever again. I am kind of happy that this Cats movie exists because, yeah, I have a great time laughing at it. It is ridiculous. And I will give some credit still to the VFX department who, I, I know it looks ridiculous, but they were doing what they were told. And some of the detail in the VFX in that movie are very impressive. And I will give the actors credit too because they gave everything they had to those roles. And... I, I don't know. I still can't wrap my brain around that right now. But that was such a colossal waste of money. Do not ever try anything in that visual style again unless you add something new to it or something that makes it work better. Please, please think that through clearly. But I also don't necessarily think that this Robin Hood movie is going to be cats all over again. Not that that thought gives me all that much faith either, because one of the last, you know, CG live action hybrid movies I saw in 2020 was Doolittle, and Doolittle is not that great. And I don't really think there are all that many movies out there that mash up CG animals with live action humans. Not that Robin Hood would necessarily do that, but CG animals with live action elements all that well. And, you know, we know the photorealistic uh, Lion King divided people out there. I think the best example I could come up with is maybe a rocket raccoon in, uh, in the Marvel movies, maybe if the characters in this Robin Hood movie look a little more so like that and are, are blended into a live action setting in that sense, this could work. But, you know, I'm just, I'm keeping an open mind. Things like this were bound to happen and I'm not willing to say this is gonna be a cat's level disaster here, but it's gonna be interesting seeing maybe the first look at the movie, the first still image or something of the sorts. And we're gonna have a while to wait for that because, you know, we can't really can't really get to making more movies right now. I caught a super chat here. Ah, Nathan Taylor wants to know my thoughts about the Kevin Bacon movie, Hollow Man. I have not rewatched Hollow Man in a very, very long time, and I don't know, maybe I should. I guess I, I vaguely remember being entertained by it, but I don't know if it's fresh enough in my mind to really give you a full-formed opinion on that, Nathan, but maybe I should look up where it's streaming right now because I got time and I am down to rewatch just about anything. Speaking of which, my plan next week is to rewatch the entire Scream franchise. Not that that's not fresh on my mind, but I gotta do it for an assignment, so keep an eye out for that. Let's get into our third story of the live stream today, and it's kind of a, a batch story here, and it's a bunch of horror movie updates for you. So, let's get into it. The first story of this little package here is the news that Fede Alvarez is gonna helm a zombie movie called 16 States, and a lot of the headlines this week focused on the fact that it was a pandemic movie, given what's going on right now, but 
I don't know, aren't all zombie movies pandemic movies? But the official description that THR gave us was a pandemic, this time with zombies, with a story of a mother trying to reach her family at the center of it. The project has been described as having shades of the Will Smith zombie movie, I Am Legend. Um, fine? That sounds very basic as far as zombie movies go to me. There's nothing about that that very brief log line that really piques my interest. But what does interest me more is Fetty Alvarez. And I know that his uh, Girl in the Spider's Web movie did not get much love. I actually never wound up seeing it because I didn't have to cover it at the time. And then when I heard the negativity, I just, I didn't bother. But I am such a big fan of his other movies. Evil Dead, the 2013 remake, I think that is hands down one of the best horror movies of the 21st century actually i think the gore and the visuals in that are incredible and don't breathe is phenomenal too so you know if if this is an original idea i have a lot more faith that he is going to get back to what he accomplished with those two movies so i have my eye on this one Next up here is a David Bruckner update. So David Bruckner, you might know, he is the director of The Ritual. He just directed The Night House, which premiered at Sundance, which I liked quite a bit this year. On top of that, he's also done some of the best segments in the first VHS movie and also the horror anthology Southbound. So he's high up on one of my direct, my favorite direct horror directors right now, directors to watch lists, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. But his project is interesting because he is going to direct the Spyglass Media reimagining of Hellraiser. And Hellraiser is one of those iconic horror movies that I think is actually ripe for a reimagining. And I do still think that that first Hellraiser movie plays quite well, but I think that after that, I guess I do kind of like the second Hellraiser now that I'm thinking about it, but the other movies spiraled out of control, and I want to see Hellraiser kind of get back to its roots. And I think David Bruckner, especially with the tone of movies like The Night House and The Ritual, I think he's going to add a texture to it that the franchise has, has very much lost. And on top of that, we've got David Goyer writing the story here, which I think, uh, I think may bode well here. And... THR is also saying that Spyglass is describing this reboot as loyal yet evolved and I don't know I, I kind of like the sound of that I mean I constantly say that whenever I hear about some sort of classic getting remade is stay stay true to the pillars that made that thing special to begin with but you also have to do something fresh so if staying loyal yet also evolving is the way they're going to describe doing that I am all for it I have faith also I don't know what's going to come first, first at this point, but if we get this Hellraiser movie before the new Scream movie, please let this Hellraiser movie be good because Spyglass is also the production company working on the new Scream movie. So actually, one way or the other, let the first one be good so I have faith, more faith in the second one. So there's the David Bruckner update. And the last horror director we're going to throw in the mix right now is Gary Doberman, who of course made his feature directorial debut with the latest Annabelle movie, Annabelle Comes Home, which... I like quite a bit. Thought it was great. And he right now, we actually knew this already. We knew he was signed on to pen a new adaptation of the Stephen King novel Salem's Lot, but now apparently, according to THR as well, he is also on board to direct it. And th this excites me. This is probably the one of the three that I'm most nervous about. And I, it might have something to do with the fact that Gary Doberman has less experience behind the lens as a director. He only has Annabelle, which, you know, was a pretty substantial start for him. And he's got a lot of experience writing, producing, and all that good stuff. But the other thing is, with all the Stephen King books that I've read, and also with all the Stephen King adaptations that I've seen, oddly enough, Salem's Lot is just not my favorite in either department it was it was probably one of the audiobooks that tested my patience the most i think there's tons of creativity and little bits that i like in it but it just didn't pack the same punch as you know i'm just pulling random titles off the top of my head right now but you know i fell in love with christine firestarter the outsider i'm just thinking about all the ones that i read most recently this this one i think could use use an update, use a, a modern feel to it. So I'm very curious to see what they do here. But as far as ranking these in terms of how much faith I have that these directors are going to be able to pull them off, it, 
I, th I think it's tough. I think I am going to go... I think I'm going to have the most faith in Fede Alvarez with 16 states, strictly because that is an original idea. And I know it's difficult to spice up the zombie genre, considering we've seen so many zombie movies. But I think I, think I have the most faith in that one right now. And then because... You know, there's been so many Hellraiser movies, and you want a movie that lives up to the original. I would then put David Bruckner's Hellraiser. And then finally, and not to say I have no faith in Gary Doberman, I think he's a great guy, and I think he's got a, a lot of great ideas up his sleeve. I'm glad he's getting this opportunity, but I think that adapting this Stephen King story in particular comes with more challenges maybe than the other two. So we will see how it pans out. I'm going to check in on the live chat now to see if you guys have anything to say about these three so, oh my god, we have so, we have so much. Chris Robinson is saying Annabelle Comes Home was so much fun. And yes, I know we roll our eyes when we use the F word so often, but that that is how I would describe Annabelle Comes Home. I think it's got some, some really great uh, production design in particular. And I think it really uses what was started in the first Conjuring movie to great effect, the Warren's Artifacts Room. And I mean, really, the way they described it at San Diego Comic-Con, I believe it was in 2018, was Annabelle meets Night at the Museum, and that is what it felt like. It felt like the kind of horror, it felt like the kind of horror movie that I would have really enjoyed when I was a teenager. I would have fallen in love with it, and I still really like it now, but it's got this playful vibe to it that I think played extremely well. So I agree with you, Chris. Oh my, Travis Earl. Travis Earl wants Zachary Quinto as Pinhead. All right. I could get behind that. I really do think that they could go a lot of different ways with that role. I mean, really, I can't think of too many restrictions as far as someone playing Pinhead. But for whatever reason, your Zachary, Zachary Quinto made me immediately think of Michael Fassbender. I don't know. Maybe Michael Fassbender would make a great Pinhead, too. Um... Ed is saying that could be amazing to Travis with uh, the Zach Quinto idea from your fingers to Gary Doberman's ears. That that would that would be that would be interesting. I'm, I'm down for that. Um, Alex Dom is saying I was excited about Salem's Lot the most. I, I don't blame you, Alex. I mean, really, anytime you break news about something that pertains to a Stephen King story, I am going to be into it. It's just you know, in this case, those other two projects might pique my interest just a little more right now. All right. Anthony Morales is saying, I've been very mixed on the Conjuring franchise. I haven't hated any of them, but I only really liked two of them. Um, Anthony, if you want to chime back in and let me know what two of them you like, I'm, I'm very curious. But as far as the Conjuring film franchise goes, that first one that came out in 2013, it was my favorite movie of 2013. And it's still one of my favorite horror movies of all time. I think they just knocked it out of the park right from the beginning. I also really do like The Conjuring 2, although I will admit that there are certain story flaws in that movie that I think makes it pale in comparison to the first, but I still think it plays very, very well. As far as the spin-offs go, I have been more disappointed than not. You guys know, Annabelle, the first one, broke my heart, especially after having fallen so hard for that first Conjuring movie. When that Annabelle spin-off came out and was so grossly disappointing, oh man, I, I don't know. I don't think I was going to recover from that. But then David Sandberg swoops in, and with Annabelle Creation, he immediately turns that sub-series around. And then I think Gary Doberman delivered big time with Annabelle Comes Home. The Nun is a different story. The Nun is a movie that I would describe as just plain old fine. It's fine. I think it is a very effective haunted house movie in the sense that it makes you feel like you're walking through. It feels like a ride. That's I think that's the way I described it. But with character development, there's little to no character development in there. So that one was disappointing in that sense. So Anthony has chimed back in. He's saying he liked the first Conjuring and the second Annabelle movie. I Spot spot on. I think those are probably the best two of the bunch. And for what it's worth, I'm still rooting for a Crooked Man movie in the near future. But as we wind down this live stream, I've got five minutes to go. Um, I do want to take more questions from you guys about just about anything. I mean, it could be... You know, how am I how am I making the most of my time at home right now? Things about movies, TV shows, you name it. While those questions are going to come in, I'm going to give you a binge watch recommendation that I feel very, very strongly about. And I know I'm late to the game on this one, but wow, Sex Education on Netflix is 
phenomenal. I, I wrote a whole piece about it on Collider.com that you could check out, but briefly, I cannot get over how effective that show is as far as having something to offer for everybody. Because you might look at that show and say, oh, it's a young adult, you know, high school sex comedy. I don't want to watch that. It's not for me. But there are also adult characters that I think experience really powerful arcs that might that might get to you. And on top of that, it's also just the idea that the entire ensemble works. Because we have um, Asa Butterfield's character, who is most certainly the lead, and we have a bunch of, you know, main characters. There's basically Otis, Maeve, and Eric in season one. I think those are the three primary characters, plus Otis's mom, Jane. But every single character in that ensemble, whether they get the most screen time or the least screen time, has an arc and has something different to say and has a different challenge that they're experiencing. So I don't know, if you don't think you're gonna connect to this, give it a shot because it really impresses me how much the two seasons of that show has to offer and I can't wait for season three right now I'm freaking out all right here's a good one from Neil because I've spent a lot of time on this platform lately Neil wants to know favorite Quibi show so if you want to know what I've watched on Quibi thus far you have you have their shows first of all but then for their original movies they're calling them movies and chapters movies and chapters I've I'm pretty much up to date I might be one chapter behind on most Dangerous Game, Survive. I started when the street lights turn on. I keep saying, I hope I didn't say that name wrong again. Um, I have to watch The Stranger. But of those, of the two uh, movies and chapters, I think I might prefer Most Dangerous Game, although I think that uh, Survive is highly watchable too. I think, I think they're basically both fine. And it's very difficult for me to review them as feature films until I'm able to see them from start to finish. But, you know, I would click, if I had access to the next chapter when I finished watching the ones that I had yesterday, I would click next in a heartbeat. I'm curious what happens next. I think they're both suitable, uh, you know, core concepts that just come with some sort of natural intrigue. So those are pretty good. But I think the stuff that I'm liking more is the TV reality content. In particular, the MTV revamps that they've done, Singled Out and Punked, I think are excellent. I think Punked actually might be my favorite thing I've watched on Quibi yet, just because it takes out all it takes out all the fluff from before, all of the uh, you know pat yourself on the back for creating a uh, a really inventive prank like this behind the scenes. It's just we didn't need all that. The things that I enjoyed about Punked most was the actual prank happening. And because of the six to eight minute runtime, that's exactly what this new version of Punked is boxed into. So it's really, it, it's great. There's no fat to trim on that show. Singled Out is great too. I think Kiki Palmer is a great host. And I am wildly fascinated by Dismantled. You guys need to see Dismantled. It's it's a cooking game show, but it's a cooking game show where the two there's two contestants, they're both chefs, and what happens is like a food cannon fires a meal at their face and they have a certain amount of time to taste as much of it as they possibly can, and then they have to recreate that meal just by tasting what was fired at them. It, I don't know who comes up with stuff like that, but it is so much fun. Titus Burgess is a great host on that. He, get, he gets great panelists to work with him, but that show is just, it, it is so wacky and enjoyable. I can't get enough of it. Uh, we also have a super chat with no question from Caleb. Caleb, you could have thrown a question in there, but Caleb is super cool. I'll tell you about him for a minute because he's part of the Patreon team. And uh, Caleb has been one of my favorite people to talk fantasy football with. And Caleb was probably one of the most encouraging people as part of the uh, the Patreon community as far as my hope in the fall, depending on what happens with live sports, to get a Patreon uh, fantasy football league going. So I am, I'm planning on doing that. Assuming that football is up and running in the fall, please let us be safe enough to get there. But if fantasy football happens, that will happen on the Patreon channel. So check out the Patreon page and I'll let you guys all know when that actual tier goes up so you could sign up. But it'll be a great time and it'll also be something that gives you access to our Slack community, which is so much fun. For anybody out there who is part of that Slack group, you guys, you're just 
great. I can't believe how quickly that took off and just exceeded my expectations with the conversation going on in there. I really, I think the world of you guys. All right, let's see if we can get a couple other things in here. Ian, Ian is saying 50 States of Fright. Oh, yeah, yeah. So 50 States of Fright, I believe, launches on Quibi on April 13th. There's not a Monday. That is a Monday. I can't figure out days anymore. But the cool thing about 50 States of Fright is that I believe the first story in it and the whole series is, is uh, executive produced by... Uh, by Sam Raimi, and uh, again, I should have rephrased that, the first story in 50 States of Fright is direct, lined up a whole bunch of other very talented individuals, namely, you know, Lee Cronin comes to mind, there's a good watch if you haven't seen it yet, The Hole in the Ground, go check out Lee's movie, Hole in the Ground, because that is very well done, but, you know, when you add up and coming genre filmmakers to a lineup like that, I am all in. Ian's back with a nut hole, Ian, this super, cry, this super chat question, might be my favorite so ian's asking or ian's asking for more booze watch alongs please so i i actually have thought about this i wonder if i wonder if starting with bruise brothers might have been a rocky start because it doesn't seem it doesn't seem like many people watched bruise brothers i didn't see any coverage of it at all except for my own but we'll we'll see what happens there but I have been thinking about more more watch along drink alongs and maybe I'll reach out to to Matt Donato and see if he's down because that was so much fun I did not admittedly I did not feel well the next day but it it was worth it we had a great time so Ian I, I think I'm gonna make that happen and if anybody has a good suggestion for a movie or show to do a watch along drink along to let, let me know I'm down to give it a go all right, let's see if we can squeeze in a couple more questions here. I did see, oh, Travis Earl is asking if I've checked out uh, In Fabric yet. It's one of his favorite horror movies since The Witch. And I understand that. I know you're not alone, Travis. I think I am in the minority with not loving it. I saw it at the Overlook Film Festival last year, and uh, it, it didn't really do it for me. I think, so with the way that story is structured, which is very unique, I was very taken by the first portion, and then I kind of lost my footing when it switches gears. So that that was my issue with that one, but I know a lot of people who are super into it. Um, Anthony Morales wants to know if I'm going to review We Summon the Darkness. I've thought about it. I've had my eye on that one for a while because I really like the main trio, but then I heard some not good things about it, so it kind of got bumped down my list, but... I'm a really big fan. I, I love Alexander Daddario. I think when she gets a great role, she could be phenomenal. Um, Amy Forsyth. You guys know I'm obsessed with Channel Zero. She was the lead of my favorite season of that show, No End House. So I'm always looking out for stuff she's working on. And then there's Maddie Hassan, who was the star of Impulse on YouTube. And I think it is so incredibly unfortunate that that show did not get the views it deserved. Because, you know, maybe... I know things worked out for Cobra Kai, so maybe this is a, isn't an accurate statement, but I don't know if the YouTube originals just didn't catch on, but Impulse was so good. When you think about it being, you know, the, the TV version of Jumper that might sound not so appealing, but the way that they adapt that story and that ability and tie it into her character's really traumatizing experience at the beginning of the show, I just thought it was so well done. Such a well-told story, such an incredible ensemble. Maddie's great. Missy Pyle plays her mother, and she's ex- If you think Missy Pyle is just a comedic actress, and she is a very talented comedic actress, but you need to see her in Impulse because she, she really is something else, and the two of them have great chemistry together, but- Check out, check out Impulse. I believe some of the YouTube originals are even streaming for free right now. So check that out. Another thing that someone brought up to me in uh, on Twitter before I even started streaming was MK Songbird had reached out and said, uh, Love Antasha is now free on Vudu with ads. So I highly recommend checking that out. That, of course, is the Anton Yelchin documentary that I, I saw at Sundance, uh, not this year, but the year before. And... Uh, you know, it's a, a tough watch given the circumstances, but he was a really beautiful individual who clearly had great passion for, for creating and for film and was just a wonderful part of the Hollywood community. So I, I think uh, seeing that side of his story might be a wonderful watch right now. So highly recommend it. All right. 
I think I think I gotta go. I think I gotta go because I'm so tempted to stay here and keep talking to you guys. But what the thing is that I've been doing that's really been improving my day, some of you know, is that I have been doing a CrossFit class every single Saturday. My CrossFit gym in LA has been doing Zoom classes, so I've been doing them most mornings, Monday through Friday, and then on uh, Saturdays they do it later in the day. So I'm gonna go do some CrossFit. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Thank you again for bearing with me at the beginning with the audio issue. I think what I'll do next week, assuming the microphone doesn't arrive in time, is I'll do it with my uh, my computer speakers again, but hopefully my USB microphone will be here by next week. So here it is. My goals for next week, if I get a USB mic, I will test it out and hopefully it will sound a lot better. And then also, I do want to do what I was telling you guys with uh, this negative space right here. I'm gonna put, I wanna like put something here, something pretty or something for uh, like a branding purpose, I don't know. I feel like there's something I could do with that and I can learn more about OBS in the process. So there it is guys, I'm out of here. I'm off to the gym. I hope you guys are all staying safe healthy. I hope you're making the most of this time at home however you can. Please, again, be kind to everybody. We all need it right now. And I will see you next Saturday for another live stream. Bye-bye, guys.